Good morning and welcome to Together in God, a media ministry of Grace Lutheran Church of the ELCA at 202 West Grand Avenue in Eau Claire. We are excited to share with you today God's message of love and hope for all. Please join us now in worship.
morning, people of God. Uh, we gather today on the ancestral lands of the, the Ho-Chunk, Ojibwe, and Dakota people, and we honor their ancestors past, present, and future. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of justice and love, you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need and awaken us to the needs of others through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Our artist of the bulletin cover today is Cecily. So she did the lovely a uh, young woman with her burning lamp waiting for the bridegroom to come, the groom to come. And the chandeliers got a little lightened in the, in the way we uh, laid it out on the page, but do know there were chandeliers. This was not a, uh, a tiny wedding banquet that was prepared, correct? And her flame is burning very bright. So thank you for doing that. She had to wait a lot in the story we heard. She was waiting and waiting and waiting for the groom to come. It's hard to wait sometimes. We've been waiting for this. We hurried, 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 hurried up in February to make a decision that this would be a good thing to do. And then we've been waiting, waiting, waiting. We're not waiting for Jesus. We're waiting for the government, which is a little different. (laughs) A lot different. Uh, But this is what we're going to be doing with places where some of the people who are out here when they were your age, they either taught, or they didn't teach, they went to the classrooms that 
these apartments are going to be in. So let's look at it and see if we can figure out what we're going to have for veterans who don't, wouldn't otherwise have a place to live. What is this picture of? Do you know that picture? Have you seen that symbol before? Oh, it looks like a potty, you're right, but it's not a potty. <laughs> but it's, it's often on the door of a potty because what it means is you can go in that potty and you can get in there if you're sitting in a chair with wheels. And so that means that these apartments will, people can get to the bedroom, that's a bed, and there's a kitchen, I think this is the kitchen, and there's a living room, and there's a potty, and all of them are places you can get to in a wheelchair. All right, so we'll have 11 apartments in all in our building. Some of them will house one person and some will have two bedrooms so there can be more people in them. They will all be veterans and there'll be people who might not otherwise have had houses. So we're looking forward to that. We thought we might be hammering already, but that didn't quite happen. But soon and very soon, as the choir will sing. <laughs> of course, Jesus took 2,000 years after they sang that, so we'll see. Um, but it's exciting to even see the pictures and get a clearer sense of where we're going. Because waiting and waiting and waiting is hard. Even when somebody, like when I was waiting for my grandma and grandpa to come, it was hard even when they showed up on time. And when things are behind, it's hard. But we wait, we act like loving people in the meantime, and we trust that eventually the things promised will come true. Let's say a prayer. Holy and gracious God, we thank you that you are a promising God and we're waiting for you to show up in our lives and bring your light and love. Teach us patience while we wait. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. The first reading is from Amos, the fifth chapter. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? Is it the darkness, not light? as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. It is not the day of the Lord, darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it. I hate, I despise your festivals and take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs, and I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like the waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The second lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, from the First Nations Version. Now, my sacred family members, we want you to understand what will happen to those who have walked on so that you will not be filled with sorrow like others who have no hope. We believe that Creator sets free Jesus, died, and rose again. We can be just as sure as the Great Spirit will, alone with him, bring back to life those who they died when they died, we're trusting in him. What we are telling you comes from the words of the honored chief, who remains alive until his coming, will not come face to face with him ahead of the ones who walked on. For our honored chief himself will come down from the spirit world above with a war cry. The voice of the chief spirit messenger will come will join with him and the eagle bone whistle will sound first the ones who died trusting in the chosen one will rise then together with them we who have remained alive will be taken up in the clouds to meet our honored chief in the air then we will always be with him use these words to lift up each other's hearts word of god word of life Thanks be to God.
You may have noticed that we're, we're reading from the First Nations translation, uh, a very recent translation of the Bible. It takes uh, into consideration the Native Americans' experiences. There's a footnote in the bulletin if you want to know a little more about that. But if the language seems different than you're used to, that's, that helps to explain it. So the good story for today was told by gift from creator Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said, when the time comes, the ones who are walking Creator's good road from above will be like ten young unmarried women who took their ceremonial torches and went out to welcome the groom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The wise ones took an extra clay pot of oil along for their torches, but the foolish ones did not bother to bring any. The groom did not come when expected, and they all fell asleep as they waited. Then suddenly, in the dark of the night, someone cried out, Look, the groom is coming. Let us welcome him. All the women woke up to prepare their torches, but the oil in the torches had run out. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil so our torches will not go out. The wise ones answered back, there's not enough for us all. Hurry, go to the village and trade for some more. They hurried away to get more oil. But while they were gone, the groom came and all the guests went into the lodge for the wedding feast. And the gate was closed. A while later, the other women came to the gate and said to the gatekeeper, Honored one, O oh, honored one, open the door and let us come in. But he said to them, I truly do not even know who you are. Why should I let you in? Here is what I'm saying to you. Be prepared like the wise women in the story, and always be ready. For you do not know the time of the day or night when the true human being will appear. The good story of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Manuel Acho, who he was one, a one-time uh, linebacker for the Eagles, and he hosts a podcast that's called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And he explained why people might want to engage him in hard conversations about racism, saying, everything great is birthed through discomfort. Everything great is birthed through discomfort. I hope he's right, <laughs> because today's lessons that we just listened to make me uncomfortable. I don't know about you. And I pray something great waits for us within them. For example, the prophet Amos comes and calls into question the very things that seem to be at the heart of our gathering today. Solemn gatherings, sacrifices, in the hopes of serving God, music lifted up to praise God. There are also things I noticed when I was offering the prayers that I was chanting, like all three of those things are in one petition. We thank you for those who are gathered here. Uh, we lift up our praise to you. But after he names those things, all those sacred acts, the prophet Amos voices God's judgment, I hate those things. Well, that makes me uncomfortable. And then I listen to the gospel, and it's hard for me to embrace its message as good news for all people. It may surprise you that some passages of scriptures bother pastors. I mean, shouldn't pastors be like the mother who, when asked which of her four sons' artwork is the best, she says they're all lovely in their own way, as my mother did? Shouldn't pastors say that when, when you're asked, what's your favorite scripture? Shouldn't we respond, well, each is lovely in its own way. But we honestly don't feel that way, so I'm just telling you. <laughs> and if that makes you uncomfortable, well, everything great is birthed through discomfort. I won't preach to you about discomfort without sharing my own. What is it about this passage that makes me squirm? In this passage, I find it really strange that a character in the parable who seems to be standing in for Jesus, the groom, 
says to those who are locked outside of his party, I don't know who you are. And leaving the door locked, he keeps them outside while the celebration goes on inside. I'm uncomfortable with it because of what I know in other stories of the scriptures. It just doesn't seem like the way Jesus usually works. I heard somebody else who was uncomfortable with this story did a retelling of it um, that I, I liked. In this version, the groom hears the knock on the door as the foolish ones arrive at the party, and they call out, and they call out at the door. I have to step out of the pulpit for a second. And uh, they knock, and the groom opens the door, and he says, Hey, I don't know you. <laughs> and he shut the door, but he was on the outside. And he went off with the five uh, foolish ones, while the, ones, the five wise ones were inside going, What in the world just happened? That's not the one the Bible gives us, but it resonates with many of the stories of Jesus that the Bible does give us. Acho's words, though, come back to haunt me. Everything great is birthed through discomfort. So it's better to struggle with the discomfort that the original scripture had, face it head on rather than trying to escape it. And at least at the end of the gospel, we get what the point is supposed to be. It's stated outright. Always be ready, for you don't know the time of the day or night that the true human being will appear. So get your torch burning and light the chandeliers. Right, Cecily? That means, returning to Amos, the hour that we spend in solemn assembly, offering our sacrifices of praise, is not an end in itself. This time that we're spending together is not an end in itself. It's to provide us with light so that we are prepared to see Christ coming to us throughout the six days and 23 hours that we don't spend in this building. The point of worship is not to get worship right, but to let our praise of the God of love prepare us to love in the world. I'll be honest, I think it was a problem when our forebearers, solemn assemblies, prayed to God, asking them to guide them in ways of righteousness, and then spent the week robbing native peoples of their land. When they praised the God of life and that they celebrated that they were the light of the world and then rained darkness and death on others, often in God's name. When that kind of dynamic is happening, it seems to me Amos's condemnation makes sense. Why God would be upset at solemn assemblies that are used to bless injustice. People of God who first heard this story of the 10 young women in the gospel were actually more like those people, the Native American people who lost their land, than they were like the settlers who took it. Rome, a power that came from outside, had stripped them of almost everything they had. And they listened to this parable thinking about that. That means the home of the parable is in that kind of absence of comfort. The earlier followers of Jesus believed that Jesus would return any minute. But 50 years later, when the story was finally written down, uh, the world-transforming return of Jesus hadn't come. They thought they knew when the groom would return, but 50 years later, the world seemed more messed up than it was before. They watched their loved ones die. They saw tyrants continue in power. They saw death and destruction on all sides. They had seen more than their share of personal loss. They tried to stay awake for 50 years and still had not found themselves in the great wedding banquet that had been promised. They felt locked out of the promise that was supposed to have arrived. Maybe it'd be right if we share in that discomfort, right? Because now it's not only been 50 years, it's been 2,000 years that we're singing soon and very soon, right? Expecting the Prince of Peace to come and bring us a reign. We watch innocent people die. We watch beautiful things get destroyed. 
We send our sons and daughters into conflicts where they pay the ultimate price for peace that never seems to come but is always out of reach. Can we be blamed if our faith flame flickers? There's a parable that, you know, the, the whole Gospel of Matthew goes together. And I was realizing there's a parable that Jesus will, tells in about 20 verses. We'll be thinking about it in a couple of weeks. And in that one, uh, unlike the one we heard today, it doesn't end with Jesus returning, but rather it begins there. And Jesus teaches the crowd, listening to that parable, that I've been coming to you every day, he says. But the surprise is he doesn't show up in the finery of wedding garb, but in worn-out clothes worn by worn-out people. Jesus says, I have come to you in those who are hungry, in those who are thirsty, those lacking basic necessities like clothing. You encountered me in strangers who arrived at your door. I came to you in those who were sick. You visited me when you went to jails. The oil we lack is often not something really spectacular, but simple day-to-day -day compassion for the people we need with their needs. Oil is being ready to be with those who are standing in front of us, to tend to each other. <clears throat> Jesus shows up in the brokenness of others while we wait for some more definitive co coming. Oil in the lamps of wise looks like feeding people at Beacon House a meal. It looks like basic necessities arriving at war-torn uh, regions carried by Lutheran World Relief offerings that came from this place. It looks like people living on a land and being honest of the history that led to their possession of it. It looks like one person accompanying another as they walk through dementia, walking beside them as their memory is fading. It looks like a long wait for one day having a building that will house those who might not have otherwise had a solution to their sheltering needs. It looks like solemn assemblies learning that to make sac learning to make sacrifices in order that our efforts flow into the great rivers of righteousness and justice that God promises will one day be a roaring river. It looks like being ready for what comes your way. It looks like trusting the great thing will be birthed by those who are not going to flee from discomfort, but will remain in it. It looks like tending one another. So may it be so. Amen. You'll notice that the fourth verse is about the parable that we struggled with today.
We together share our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us turn our hearts to God, our breath and life, as we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. O God, for whom we wait, come quickly to your people. Bring your salvation and center us in the hope found only in you. Deepen our faith through meaningful worship in our solemn assembly so that we flow in the direction of your justice and righteousness. Hear us, O God. O God, for whom we watch, we glimpse your power in rushing water and your beauty in the darkening night. Restore this creation and provide clean water to all people and animals. Save us from foolish, wasteful living. Hear us, O God. O God, for whom we long, let justice roll down like waters on all nations. Be in places like Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, making way for pathways to peace. Hear us, O God. Be with those who have given their lives in the hope of making the world a better, safer place. Be with veterans who seek to find life-giving ways to serve having returned home. Be with grace as we continue to lean into the hope of providing apartments for those who have served. Hear us, O God. O God, in whom we hope, we pray for all who are in need. Provide for those who experience homelessness or hunger. Support the under or underemployed. And comfort any who are suffering this day, especially those we name aloud and in our hearts now. Hear us, O God. Teach us to have the courage to enter into discomfort that we might find a more faithful way to be with you. When our resources feel exhausted, be the light that leads us home. Hear us, O God. O God, in whom we remain, we remember our loved ones who have died and now live in you. Bring comfort and the assurance of a new life to all who grieve. Hear us, O God. We offer our spoken prayers and those held in our hearts, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us share that peace.
We pray together the prayer our Lord teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is based on the first lesson that we heard today.
to love and serve the Lord. Thank you for being part of our Together in God worship service. Your prayers and financial support are always deeply appreciated. Please tune in again next Sunday at the same time or join us in person at 10 a.m. in the church. Remember the 9 a.m. coffee hour. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.